Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 30th meeting of 2017. Agenda item number one is a decision on taking item six in private, which is consideration of further witnesses for stage one scrutiny of the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communication repeal Scotland bill. Are we all agreed to take this item in private? Thank you. Agenda item number two is subordinate legislation and consideration of the affirmative instrument on Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986 Amendment Regulations 2017 Draft. And I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and her officials, Aileen Grimmer, Civil Law Legal System Division. Gaynor Davenport, Director of Housing and Social Justice, and Sadif Ashraf, Director of Legal Services. I'll remind members that uh, the officials are permitted to give evidence under this item but may not participate in the debate on the instrument under agenda item number three. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and invite the minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you and good morning, convener. And I'm pleased to be here today to present the regulations that make provision for legal aid in certain circumstances to be available in the first tier tribunal, housing and property chamber. Regulations are needed to ensure that civil legal aid will continue to be made available when the functions and jurisdiction of the sheriff court in civil cases relating to tenancy-related disputes in the private rented sector transfer to the First Year Tribunal Housing and Property Chamber on 1st December 2017. The regulations will also allow for civil legal aid to be available for disputes in relation to the new private residential tenancies provided for under the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016, which also comes into force on the 1st of December of this year. The First Year Tribunal Housing and Property Chamber has a less adversarial approach where legal representation will not be the norm. However, given that in the cases being transferred from the Sheriff Court, eviction is a possible outcome, it was considered important to maintain the status quo as far as the availability of legal aid is concerned. It should also be noted that these regulations before the committee today do not involve any changes to the eligibility uh, criteria. The regulations provide for consequential transfer of all existing legal aid provisions except for applications by landlords in relation to the appeal of landlord registration matters under the Antisocial Behaviour Scotland Act 2004. It should be noted here that the policy objective is to develop landlord registration and letting agent registration in parallel and moreover to mirror in this regard existing procedures for property factors in the first tier tribunal property and housing chamber. No legal aid is available, available for property factors regarding these matters. No legal aid is to be available for the new letting agents regime and hence in the interest of parity of treatment it is not proposed that legal aid be available for such landlord registration matters uh, in that uh, there should not be any difference in treatment for such matters. Uh, and even assuming, which is less likely, that uh, eligibility conditions would be met uh, for such, such applications, it is, as I say, not proposed that legal aid be available for those uh, particular matters. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions, convener. Uh, before we move to questions, there's um, two declarations of interest, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. I just wish to declare my interest as a landlord in the private rented sector, a member of the Scottish Association of Landlords and a solicitor with current practicing certificates from the Law Societies of Scotland and England and Wales. Uh -huh. And Ben McPherson. I just remind the committee that I'm registered on the role of Scottish solicitors. Okay. Are there any questions for the Minister from um, members? There's no questions. We now move to a formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on this instrument and has no comment on it. The motion is 08. 085 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986 Amendment Regulations 2017 draft be approved. Uh, will the Minister move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you, Minister. Put the question that um, this is agreed, a member agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. Um, that concludes consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of this debate that we are all agreed. And is the committee content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft of the report? Thank you for that. 
Can I thank the Minister and the officials for attending and I suspend briefly to allow the Minister and officials to leave. Instrument. This is the Civil Legal Aid Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 Oblique 310. I refer members to Paper 2, which is a note by the Clerk. Um, do members have any comments or questions about this SSI? No comments or, uh, um, or recommendations, therefore, um, is the committee agreed it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. And we now move to agenda item number five, which is our second evidence session on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland bill. And I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper five, which is a spice paper. And welcome when he comes, which should be shortly, <laughs> James Kelly will be attending as the member in charge of the bill. Um, I welcome Danny Boyle, Parliamentary and Policy Officer, Black and Ethnic Minority Infrastructure in Scotland, Beamish, and Tom Halpin, Chief Executive, Safeguarding Communities, Reducing Offending, Sacro, and Sandy Ria, um, Vice Chairman, Scottish Disabled Supporters Association, and Colin McFarlane, Director of Stonewall Scotland. Can I thank all the witnesses who have supplied the written evidence, found this particularly helpful and very detailed in some of the responses. Um, we'll move to questions, and if I could start off um, by asking the the various panel members if they are in favour or against repeal and why they hold that view. Who would like to start? Mr okay. Boyle? I don't mind going first. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Uh, good morning, convener. Good morning, members. Uh, thank you very much for having us along this morning to discuss um, this very serious uh, piece of legislation and the general uh, issues and social concepts which surround it with regards to hate crime, uh, inequality and human rights. So with regards to, <clears throat> as a direct answer, do we support the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act? Yes, we do. And the reason we do support the repeal of uh, that particular piece of legislation is we are not convinced that it appropriately or effectively tackles hate crime in Scotland. So. If the committee will allow, I will give a very brief overview of why we have that rationale. So in 2016-17, there were 3,349 racially aggravated charges in Scotland. Over the lifetime of the Act, between 2012 and 2017, there have been over 20,000. Over the duration of the Act, from 2012 to 2017, there has been a total of 64 racially aggravated charges under the Act. The predominant hate crime charge under the Act has been for religious aggravation, and the predominant characteristic within the religious aggravation is anti-Catholic, over 75% of charges in every reporting year. That being said, in relation to the volume of attendees at Scottish football matches, hate crime charges under the Act actually account for less than 50% 
of all charges in every year of reporting. Indeed, the year the Act was used most often, in 2016-17, constituting 377 charges, only 18% of these were for hate crimes. So we support generally a policy of mainstreaming and coherence which strives to ensure a remedy for those who face hate crime on a daily basis in Scotland. This Act does not achieve it. It creates a disproportionate focus on one section of society when the overwhelming majority of hate crime is taking place somewhere else. It is also misleading to promote this Act as primarily a piece of hate crime legislation. It deals mostly with threatening behaviour, fighting or threats to fight, so it's reclassified uh, Section 74, breach of the peace. That's a laudable aim, but it's not a hate crime charge. We're additionally concerned that the breadth of the law may create restrictions on freedom of expression and equality for all, specifically Section 12E of the Act covering other behaviour that a reasonable person would be likely to consider offensive. From a minority community's perspective, this poses challenges. Some of the communities we work with are not always part of the dominant social narrative. When it comes to contested social issues where there can exist two valid, if opposed, opinions, this can create real problems. We've also um, touched our, we, we've been aware of some of the broader um, discussion around that the act should be extended out to um, other sections of society. Again, this is something that we're slightly concerned with. In relation to the race equality framework for Scotland, um, which was launched in March 2016, there was a recognition within the race equality framework for Scotland that we have to have a much more broader uh, conversation about the role of the transatlantic slave trade in Scotland, about Scotland's co-participation uh, in colonial endeavours in the empire, and how that is now manifested within social issues which can affect communities in Scotland today. Applying section 12E uh, in a much more broad, broader context to contested social issues could potentially pose much larger problems for min minority community views. So for those varied reasons, and we look forward to extending that discussion with members today, we support the repeal of the legislation. Be before I move on to the other um, panel members, I wonder if you could comment on the, um, on the policy memorandum which you highlighted and the, um, the acknowledgement that about sectarianism, you have some written evidence in that which I found quite interesting, it being a social concept as opposed to um, and having no legal ca characteristic in yeah. Scots law. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the general point is that the, the whole concept of sectarianism remains a contested social issue. Um, we have had recommendations from um, Dr Duncan Morrow's independent advisory group and what a, a defini definition of uh, sectarianism should, should take. Um, but our general argument is that that has to happen uh, independent of the judiciary uh, as a first point of call because it remains a contested term. Hate crime, where hate crime occurs, where it is anti-Catholic, anti-Protestant, um, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic is quite clear. However, the general jargon, particularly in relation to the, the whole contested concept of sectarianism, has been caught up in section 1, 2E of the Act. So things which aren't necessarily sectarian from our perspective are being called sectarian, uh, and that's clouding the, the broader narrative around about what the Act sets out to achieve uh, and what its purpose is. Interested in having no legal character in Scots law, and therefore, you know, it's almost like it's, it's based on a false premise. Uh, that's what I, I read from your submission. Is that more or less what what, what you, you meant to say in, in that? Well, the policy memorandum, which uh, supports the Offensive Behaviour Act, uh, acknowledges uh -huh, that sectarianism, yeah. as, as a word, has no legal concept in Scots uh -huh. law. And that's part of the, the problem as you see it with the... Uh, well, that debate has to happen independent of um, being taken through uh, the courts, has to happen and, and within civic society uh, and then social political issues have to be debated independent of um, okay. catch-all legislation. Thank you. Anyone else like to go next? Mr Halpern? <coughs> Thank you, uh, Kavina. Um, in terms of uh, SACRO, I, I just right from the outset, uh, endorse the intention of the Act initially in terms of hate crime and prejudice. So anything I say about repeal in no way t detracts from the, 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 the reprehensible issue that that is. 
However, working on the ground with people who actually uh, are uh, arrested or uh, reported for that crime, I have some learning from that. And it, it, it is more around the sectarianism element of it. Um, SACRO operates a, 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 a project uh, tackling offending pre prejudices in which we receive referrals from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. We, we also work with people who have uh, been in community payback orders, maybe for other offences, but uh, have exhibited those attitudes. And it's a cognitive behaviour uh, therapy programme getting into attitudes and uh, the, the, the belief systems. The reality is, in uh, the year that we've talked about where there's more cases, 16-17, that project received 26 referrals in Scotland. So there's an inconsistency about how the Act is being applied in, in, in terms of the numbers coming through. Because of those 26, seven cases included uh, what would be de de determined as sectarianism. One of them was sectarianism and homophobia. But of those seven, three came through the, uh, the, the Act. So that right away you know that the legislation beyond this Act is actually taking into account those behaviours as well. So you then look at the specific application of legislation around one group in society, uh, football. And, and look at uh, predominantly the backgrounds of people attending that. And, 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 you know, the, the, the disadvantage for so many people, etc. And you apply stigmatisation in there as well when you specifically look at an act for one group like that. And, and, and when I was putting my own submission together, I was trying to um, balance that out and why would you legislate against a, a behaviour, etc. And it's, for me, it's got to be a case so compelling that it must be legislated for. And... When you look at those uh, four cases within the seven who were not uh, dealt with under a, that act, how compelling is that? And if you look at one group in society, now I understand the broader prejudices are represented here in discussions, and that, that's a bigger discussion, but I'm talking about the act in relation to this area, which is uh, the, the bringing quite controversial views at the moment. And, and, and on balance, in Sacro at the start uh, of our journey, uh, supported the bill, and, 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 and there's lots of principles the bill would support. But on balance, we would say that the, the, the broader legislation is um, there and is available. Given fixed penalty tickets to, to people who... And, and the age groups, if you look at those 26, are pretty balanced when you go from 20 through to 50. Uh, and, and, and the, so it's not just a, a young person or a, a, a middle-aged, no, you know, if you look at that group as a sample, it, it, it's, it's a broad age range. But if you just simply give a fixed penalty ticket to someone who's chanting something that they would say their uncles and their father did in the past and they don't understand it, you, you, you send someone away who's not changed their attitude and indeed maybe even angrier because they've just lost some of the, the, the money that they'd, they've not got a lot of in the first place. Penalty? Are you talking about the transitional arrangements and when they would come in, or more the, general? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 and exactly. And, that, that, and part of my submission was that that should mm. shouldn't happen. Um, but when you look at it, unless you are actually looking at the behaviours and working with the behaviours that underlie and the belief systems, you ain't going to change this. And and, and the low level of referrals in show that at the moment that there is an inconsistency in its application that. Um, Mr. Rake or Mr. McFarlane, who would like to go next? Mr. McFarlane, I think. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence today. Um, Stonewall Scotland supports the principles of the Act. We supported that um, when the Act was going through the process uh, through Parliament 2011-2012. Um, Our view is it sends a very clear message that abusive behaviour at football is not acceptable. <coughs> Excuse me. And we know from our research there is a clear uh, issue around LGBT people and their fear of attending football matches. So we know that 60% of sports fans in Scotland have witnessed anti-LGBT language or abuse in a sports setting in the last five years. And of that, 82% of Scottish fans have witnessed that behaviour in a football setting. <clears throat> 
LGBT people tell us that that's one area of sport that they don't feel safe or secure, whether that's from chanting, whether that's from comments that are made on the stands. And our view very much was that uh, the act at the time um, was going to send a very clear message that that kind of behaviour wasn't acceptable. So our view that repealing the act without other measures in place um, could undermine work that's been made by organisations like Stonewall, the Equality Network, football clubs, Police Scotland, the criminal justice agencies to increase LGBT people's confidence, not only reporting hate crime, but also in attending sporting events like football. Um, we would agree that there are implementation issues. Uh, one of the things that we've said in our submission that the Act has been in place for five years. It's probably time for review to look at what's working and what isn't working. And obviously, Lord Brackadale is uh, taking out his review of hate crime legislation at the moment. And our view would be that, that nothing should happen until that hate crime review has reported back. That would be the good time to look at what needs to be done, whether the act needs to go, what reform needs to be done in the act if it's going to stay, um, and looking at hate crime legislation in the round. So uh, repealing the act without anything in place we think would be uh, damaging would send a very negative signal to LGBT people. Our view very in particular is most LGBT people will not be watching this today, they won't be pouring through the official report, they won't be looking at the intricacies of the different elements of the Act, but what they will see is a headline that says the Act that protects them potentially at football matches has gone, um, and that would then lead to a, a lack of confidence. Okay, and Mr Eyck. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak today. Um, I am very new at this, so please uh, think if I'm unprepared that uh, there's probably a the right area because we came into this very late. Uh, the Scottish Disabled Supporters Association are a very young organisation. It's formed out of the back of uh, UEFA. Um, and I look after all, all the clubs and, and their bits and pieces in Scotland. Um, I agree with the rest of the team here that uh, we can't have nothing at all because there is the elements that it's not just it's just it's across the board that uh, they don't people don't care uh, sometimes is the case and they don't uh, don't realise how that how it affects people with disability how they can take uh, take and uh, chants and songs and speech um, and it's, it's right across the board that's whether whether you're in a wheelchair. Uh, uh, ambulant, disabled, uh, autistic, um, uh, or with learning difficulties, and a lot of people forget that this uh, has a different effect to somebody with a normal ability. Um, to get rid of it, the uh, legislation completely is, I think, is wrong. But I still think there needs to be something put in place or kept in place for uh, for the future. So can it be clear then, um, if something else was in place, you might be in, in, in favour of repeal, or are you against um, repeal per se? I'm, I'm against the, the repeal, but against unless, the repeal. unless it's, uh, there is something in place, if it's reviewed or updated. Uh -huh. But you think it, it's not perfect then? Is, is that your, your, your solution yes. for, and you, you would like it to be looked at again and reviewed? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's quite clear. Thank you. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I think, despite differing views, probably everyone would agree that there is offensive behaviour takes place generally and at football. Um, can I ask you if you think this, this at football it's a problem that could be dealt with by the clubs? And also, um, can I... Uh, Mr Riggs just said that he thinks something needs to replace this act if it's repealed. Can I ask the views of the other members of the panel all on that? Because there would clearly be a gap left if this uh, act was repealed. Mr Halpin? Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think it's a problem that, that is broader than just the clubs. Uh, uh, there is offensive behaviour there. And in, in, in many, many occasions, that is criminal behaviour. And there is broader legislation that is available there in terms of aggravations and, and, and hate crime legislation. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'd have to uh, defer to others to give you the specific acts. But our referral shows that people are being charged with offences under that other legislation and are being able to be referred into uh, initiatives like our own, which also includes 
outreach in terms of education. It's not just about the 26 people we worked with in direct. And, and, and we could work with more. We have people trained across Scotland and there are other uh, initiatives like that. Um, but the idea that someone who, whose behaviour is so embedded and so um, offensive that the, the clubs are going to change them by taking away their season ticket or whatever, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't tackle the, 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 the hatred that's in there. So it has to be broader than the clubs, the point you were making. So by extension, that would mean then that you think there would be a gap if it was repealed? There has to be something else? Uh, uh, the, the point I did make was of the cases that were referred to as um, four out of seven did not come through this legislation. So there is other legislation there, and I, I do believe if that's applied appropriately, then it would cover that, that, that gap. Okay. Mr Boyle. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll very, cover very briefly what's criminalised by the Act and then uh, touch upon, I think, what's, what's probably the most pertinent point. Uh, where are we going to go from here and what are we going to do next? So in terms of the Act, the, the Act is, as I said in my introductory comments, the Act's primarily reclassified the breach of the peace as threatening behaviour. So 60%, 60 of the charges over the lifetime of the Act are for this category. Now, in the words of the Crown Office, the charges classified as threatening where the accused threatened another, another person or people involved the accused acting in a disorderly or aggressive manner, making threats or challenging others to fight or where they engaged in fighting. So a laudable uh, criminal justice aim to prevent. We can see this from the majority of the charges being in relation to a single game, the Scottish Cup final in 2016-17. So in short, it's covering serious issues with regards to public order. It is unclear then to be missed why these issues are collated and being portrayed as being in relation to hate crime. So we already suffer from a lack of clarity as to the locus, motivation, ethnicity, other characteristics of those who are victims of hate crime. The dissemination of stats, this dissemination of stats in relation to the Offensive Behaviour Act further clouds this ambiguity and doesn't offer us any illumination to the extent or not of hate crime issues in Scotland. So, as we previously touched on, it does cover some instances of hate crime, as I've outlined, uh, constitutes less than 50% of all charges in each year of reporting, and as low as 18% in 1617. The vast majority, as we've touched upon, are anti-Catholic, and this reflects a broader issue that we already know that the vast majority of religiously aggravated hate crimes in Scotland are anti-Catholic, and have been for every year since devolution. If we had disaggregated data on the ethnicity of those who suffer racially aggravated crime, it would be incredibly helpful. Now, that being said, any hate crime is utterly unacceptable and where it is anti-Protestant, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic or any other protected characteristic, we need to identify it individually and not consume it into generic catch-all narratives. So over the whole lifetime of the Act in relation to hate crime, specifically in relation to hate crime, not a reclassified breach of the peace, We've had 64 race charges, six anti-Semitic charges, four Islamophobic charges over the five years. Uh, and then within that, we've had eight homophobic charges uh, and one aggravation where disability ha has been the charge. So all of, these, all of these hate crimes are covered by pre-existing legislation. There is absolutely nothing new in the Act to deal with hate crime that did not exist before 2011. As an aside point, and I think this is the key point, the Brackadale Review has been initiated to bring some clarity to the suite of hate crime laws and live legal, in legal instruments in Scotland. So we know that the spread of these laws is confusing to the victims of hate crime in terms of getting an effective remedy. Which piece of legislation do they approach? The Football Act has just enhanced this confusion as opposed to help us to deal with it. So in terms of our submission to the Brackadale Review, and I was discussing this with Colin, uh, on the way in the door, we think the most sensible approach would to be create a universal approach to tackling hate crime, one which is both uh, preventative and rooted in education, and one which also has a strong legal remedy when that is necessary. Now, the most simple way that we could envisage that being taken forward would be have a piece of hate crime legislation which reflects the characteristics in the Equality Act, which can be evolved and updated as society changes and so on and so forth. Some of the contested is issues which remain live within the context of the Football Act, which don't actually constitute a uh, hate crime and are separate. They, it's the reasonable uh, offence to a reasonable person. That is a debate that has to happen outside of the legislation. We have already seen with the implementation of this legislation that it's polarised the judiciary, it's polarised the police and certain sections of football fans, and to some extent it's polarising the qualities organisations about the, the best approach 
uh, to tackling hate crime. So we, we, we struggle to see the value in continuing down this road and would much rather see an informed, uh, universal approach and strategy to challenging hate crime in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Just to say that some of the remarks you made are not what we heard from the police at a previous evidence session. They're, they're not finding it confusing. <coughs> But the the act is an anomaly in terms of our relationship with the police. I have to be perfectly frank with you. We have an uh, incredibly positive and proactive working relationship in the, with the police in every other facet um, of, of work that we do. There's some fantastic work being done by the Equality and Diversity Unit and our, the police officers, community police officers on the ground in terms of engaging refugees and minorities and so on and so forth. Where we've had our most robust and frank conversations with Peace Scotland is in relation to the implementation of this Act. Now, it's not a surprise, uh, it doesn't surprise me that it's within Police Scotland's interest to maintain uh, Section 12E of the legislation, which is offence to a reasonable person, and that power is instilled within an individual police officer on the ground who then makes, a, 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 you know, makes an, a, an assessment of any given situation. We actually also feel that it's, it places individual police officers in a very precarious position. They're not anthropologists or sociologists or political commentators, so it's a very, very, very difficult uh, piece of legislation for them to implement. It puts them immediately uh, in, in a negative interaction with individual football fans or individual members of society and actually fundamentally undermines the whole concept of policing by consent. So we have a degree of sympathy for them in that context. But, view, but it's not what we've heard from the police. I just want to, to state that again. Um, Mr McFarland, do you have any comment? There was a lot in what uh, Danny was saying there, so I'm trying to pick some of it. Um, mm. I, I, don't, I don't agree that we're polarised. I think we're probably coming from the, the same place overall, which is that we want to make sure that um, any of our constituents feel safe and secure when they're attending sporting events, be that football, whatever. I think uh, I'll go back to what I said earlier about the, the principle of the Act and the message that it sends. That's the bit that we, that we agree with. Whether the Act goes or stays, we're not particularly wedded to religiously on that. But what we're saying is if the act is to stay, then we've already, we've highlighted in our evidence where we think there are areas for improvement and some of the implementation hasn't gone quite right. We think particularly around LGBT reporting and recording. Um, but if it goes and there's nothing in its place, that's our big worry. The, the signal that will send to LGBT people, and as I mentioned earlier, the really good work that Police Scotland have been doing, other organisations, ourselves, the Equality Network, LGBT Youth, um, our work with the Premier League, and uh, the Scottish uh, Premier Football League, and with clubs to start building the confidence of LGBT people around attending matches, being able to feel safe and secure in sporting environments, that act is quite symbolic for them because it gives them that sense that they are covered. And as I mentioned earlier, that they're not going to know a lot of the time the intricacies of what legislation covers them and what doesn't cover them but what they will know is that if they go to a football match and they hear homophobic chanting or somebody throws homophobic or biphobic transphobic abuse at as an individual that act will protect them and that's the bit that we are supportive of the principle of the act but i'll refer back to the bracadale review as well and i think danny is actually right in what he's saying that the 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 whole gamut of legislation is quite confusing and it probably would be better um, and I don't want to preempt what Bracadale is going to say, if there was some streamlined system of what the hate crime legislation looks like. Um, so uh, we are saying that let's wait and see what Bracadale comes back with, and then we can look at, review, and move forward about whether or not the act remains and needs improved or reviewed, or whether there needs to be something else in its place that covers that. But we think the Bracadale review is going to be the good way to kind of look at that, rather than, you know, let's not get rid of the act before Bracadale reports back. I think that would be folly. Supplementary, Lee McCarthy. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks very much for, for your evidence. Uh, by the way, I'm struggling to get my head around this concept of the message that would be sent with repeal of this bill. I mean, I can understand why legislation, in part, is about sending a message of, of, of um, Parliament and wider society's acceptance or unacceptance of, of, of particular um, behaviours or, or, or whatever. But an act that we're hearing isn't delivering beyond what the, the gamut of legislation currently delivers, isn't sending the right message if it's convincing people it's providing uh, protections it doesn't actually provide, and that those protections would be better provided, would they not, be by repealing this legislation and 
through the Bracadale Review, providing uh, through equalities legislation, as Mr Boyle suggested or wherever, uh, a more effective um, catch-all for the sorts of um, protection against behaviours that we've all agreed are reprehensible. I can't understand why we want to keep in place a piece of legislation as a way of sending a message about pro providing protections that that legislation doesn't actually provide. Support the principles of the Act, but what I also said is we're not wedded to that Act. So if the Act is to go or to be uh, reviewed, for us it's the implementation aspect. We have we have looked at where some of the implementation issues are there. We don't disagree with that, but as a signal, as an LGBT fan or as an LGBT person, if you know that that Act exists and you know that that's going to protect you, yeah, there are the bits of legislation that are there, but the Act itself, it's, it's, it's the symbolic element of it. But we're not wedded to whether or not the Act should definitely stay or go, but what we want to make sure that is currently, if the Act is there, the signal that that sends. If the Act was to go and there was nothing in its place, what does that then say? But I think the Bracadell review around that is looking at elements around hate crime reporting in general. We know, for example, that um, very few LGBT people still report hate crimes. That's a confidence issue that we need to work with in terms of Police Scotland, we need to work with civic society. On a football area as well, that's about making clubs uh, being safer places for LGBT people too. We're not saying that the Act is perfect, it's not. But what we're saying is if you just blanketly get rid of the Act and there's nothing in its place, what signals does that then send to LGBT people about whether they feel safe and secure in a football setting or a sports setting? And that's where we have an issue with a blanket repeal straight away with nothing in its place. Back to Bracadale, we think that is the point where the Bracadale Review will come back with recommendations to look at those recommendations and see what Bracadale uh, suggests and then take that further from there. I think as, as somebody who's expressed concerns about, um, uh, well, about the Act and, and is supportive of the repeal, I, I'm concerned that, that the position that I and, and, and others in, in, in this committee, in this parliament have in relation to repeal would be construed as sending a, 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 an unfortunate message to those in the LGBT community, which I think this parliament has a pretty um, uh, unrivaled uh, track record in doing much to, uh, to, to, to support. Uh, but we're hearing the concerns that Mr Boyle and others have, have raised about the effectiveness of this act and actually the effect that it's having on the relations uh, within the Equalities Network, between the Equalities Network um, individuals and, and the police and whatnot. I just, I am, I, I am I'm really wary about this issue about messaging. I would be interested in Mr Boyle's position on this, but the idea that if we were to repeal this, that this somehow would be sending a, an unfortunate message uh, about this Parliament's support for those in the LGBT uh, community is one I, I, I think would find very difficult to, to understand or accept. Let's so come back on yeah. that. LGBT people tell us that that act gives them confidence that they can attend those events, that they feel that they're protected and they're safe and secure. They also tell us that if that act was to go, they don't know what then protects them. So what you would need in place then is a proper campaign, an information campaign, Scottish Government taking lead and charge in that, Police Scotland taking charge and lead on that, to remind LGBT people about if there is existing legislation that's there, lead in this well in yeah absolutely as well. I, I mean, mean if we we're do... being told that the, the legislation isn't providing the protection that that those in the LGBT, lgbt community believe it is then that seems to be a problem at the moment irrespective of what we're we're considering at the at the present time very briefly that and i'm entirely sympathetic to to other colleagues uh, who have concerns around about um, hate crime aggravations which continue in, in any particular circumstance in Scotland and they would have us as, as, as an ally in challenging and taking that forward but our precise point here and the danger of this legislation around about perceptions of uh, coverage of, of support and actual lived experience of the implementation of the Act, the danger of this legislation and why it's unnecessary because it precisely rides on the back of tackling an actual problem of hate crime and the public consciousness which goes alongside it. As we've already said, the vast majority of charges are not for hate crimes. What also, also develops from this is, is different experiences of different characteristics in relation to different pieces of legislation. So what we share in common is uh, an aspiration to tackle and challenge hate crime across the board. 
what's unique potentially to the race and ethnicity and the legal definition of race within the Equality Act to this piece of legislation is that minority communities have a different experience virtue of the fact of the new offence of Section 12E, which uh, criminalises general offence to uh, a reasonable person. So if I was going to try and, try and put that from an LGBT perspective without putting words into your mouth, <laughs> if there, for example, was a, a football team in Scotland who had a, a, a really strong I, uh, LGBT identity uh, and the, the LGBT community had developed that cl club and created it, and then they found that virtue of Section 12E, uh, other people in society found that insulting or offensive and you found that your members were being criminalised virtue of it, then you would take a different uh, view stance on it. So we absolutely share uh, the aspiration to tackle hate crime across the board, but this piece of legislation uh, isn't actually um, achieving that. It's been described as, you know, I'm, I'm surprised actually, and we hope maybe in due course that some of the human rights advocates will be welcomed along to uh, give evidence as well, because there's fundamental issues around about freedom of expression with regards to... Uh, this piece of legislation, liberty, um, highly respected, described section 1, 2 e, breathtaking expansion of the criminal law. Um, we would encourage Scottish Human Rights Commission, the Equality Human Rights Commission, to additionally uh, have, something, have something to say with regards to that. Mr Boyle, we will have it covered. <laughs> um, ben? Supplementary, th thank you, convener. With regard to, to Colin McFarlane's evidence, I think you, you spoke about partnership working with other organisations in, uh, in the LGBTI community. And um, the Equality Network recently published uh, their Scottish LGBTI hate crime report in 2017. And Mary Fee lodged a, a motion in this parliament that received cross-party support. And I just, I note with that, that it, sp it stated that there an acknowledged concern about uh, the existence of LGBTI discrimination in football with 66% of respondents stating that they had either experienced or witnessed homophobic, biphobic or transphobic hate crime at matches when travelling to and from games or at a venue where a match was being shown. And I think, isn't the concern that you were articulating earlier that by repealing this piece of legislation, you're removing a key part of the criminal justice system in order to tackle that very fact that's been reported this year? And as I said, 82% of Scottish fans from our research has showed that they've witnessed that behaviour and done so in a football, uh, football setting. That's anti-LGBT language uh, and abuse. Um, the way I kind of look at it is sometimes it's a jigsaw puzzle. That the, 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 um, uh, the legislative framework, the work that goes on in schools, the work that goes on in our communities, the work that organisations like ourselves do, it, it's all part of a jigsaw puzzle. And these are different bits of that, that puzzle that create the final big picture. My view and Stonewall's view has been that the act, the principle of the act has been part of that armory, if you like, about tackling homophobic, biphobic and transphobic uh, language, abusive behaviour, discrimination in Scottish society. Our research has shown, the Equality Network's ne uh, research has shown that in a football setting, this is a clear issue. And our belief in 2011 was that, that the principles of the act, uh, we supported that. We still believe in the principles of the act, um, and that that's part of that armory of tackling homophobic, biphobic and transphobic uh, abuse discrimination in society. If you take that away, then you're taking a bit of that jigsaw puzzle away. And unless there's something in its place uh, that fills that gap, then we do have that worry that, that things will fall through the net, that the signal it sends. And, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying around... Um, you know, the, the symbolism sometimes and the message it sends, these messages are so important to LGBT people. They need to know and to feel that they are safe and secure, whether that's at school, in the workplace, in their communities, or whether that's attending a football match. Um, if I can use a personal example, if that's okay, if the committee allow me to do that. Um, uh, my dad died 20 years ago, and he was a huge Rangers fan. Um, and, you know, growing up, I'm uh, an only child, I'm his only son. Um, you know, he wanted me to go to football matches with him. And, uh, you know, as a teenager, I was coming to terms with my own sexuality. Um, and I knew the kind of language that was used on the terraces. You could hear it um, on match days around Ibrox, whatever, you could hear it 
consistently. And I used every excuse possible not to attend those matches with my father because I was absolutely terrified about what I would hear and whether any of his friends that might be there might use that language and what that would mean for me. It's a piece of great regret for me that I wasn't able to do that thing with my dad, that I wasn't able to spend that time with him. And in my view, be a good son in that way. For us, it's about ensuring that any LGBT kid is able to participate fully in a family environment, to go with their families, to partake in sport, to go and watch their football team, and to not feel worried or scared um, that they're going to hear or see that kind of language or see abusive behaviour. The act is that kind of element that holds that jigsaw puzzle in that way because people will feel confident that they know the act is there. And I repeat, they are not going to watch this committee today. They're not really going to look at the OR. But what they are going to hear is a newspaper report or a news report that the act that's in its place that protects them in football matches might go. And that then sends a very negative uh, uh, message to them that they might not feel safe or secure in a football setting. Thank you very much, and for that personal reflection. That was very Stuart powerful. Stevenson, very briefly, supplementary, and if your supplementaries could be less long-winded, that would be very much appreciated. Um, this is probably fairly brief, and it's directed to Mr McLean. In particular, uh, I draw attention to Section 6 of the uh, bill that's before us, uh, which is commencement. The Act comes into force on the day after royal assent. Am I hearing implicitly, if not explicitly, that the commencement, if Parliament passes this bill into law, should not be until there is a replacement regime. Uh, and uh, Sorry, I'll just, to be clear, and that perhaps as an alternative uh, in there, a specific timetable so that it doesn't become a blank check to never doing anything if Parliament passes this. Is that what I'm hearing? In terms of the transitional arrangements, yeah, our, our view would be that um, don't, you know, don't repeal the Act unless there's something in its place. And I think what we're going back to, and I'll, I'll keep saying this, I'm so sorry, is the Bracadell Review is the opportunity to do that. So we would say delay repeal of the Act. If the Act is going to go, delay that until Bracadell has come back and reported and the recommendations are there. That's the opportunity to then look at whether or not the Act uh, should remain and be improved, or whether or not if the Act is to go, what needs to go in its place, and whether or not, and again, I don't want to preempt what Bracadell is going to say, but if Bracadell comes back and says there should be a whole new sweet system of how we uh, lump our, uh, our equality laws together and our, our hate crime laws together, then that's the opportunity to look at where we take that forward. Wants to come up to. I appreciate the, the narrative which is accompanying some of the discussion, but I would just refer committee members and general public back to the, the stats we have with relation to this piece of legislation. As we've already said, last year it was used most often, 18% of the crimes were for hate crimes. Over the whole duration um, of the Act, there's been eight um, homophobic charges, and I think a, a, Assistant Chief Constable... I'm asking a specific question about commencement. I wonder if you could address that. I will, okay. If you don't want to, you don't have to. No, I'm quite happy because it's actually totally, totally pertinent to the point that I'm in the middle of making. Assistant Chief Constable Higgins um, commented in his own uh, verbal submission that out of four million uh, attendees at football, which I'm, I'm guessing is not four million of Scottish citizens, which would be quite an incredible attendance rate, but four million added up over all the attendances of that 0 0.00000 5% of people do me. attended. It's okay, no, because your specific was on Section 6. Yes. And should Section 6, should, this re should the repeal of the Act go through, will Section 6 leave a major gap in the law? It's, no, it's, I'm not asking that, because self-evidently it would. I'm asking if, in response to the specific points, I think the LBGT people are saying that they feel protected by the intention of the Act, you know, regardless of the legal impact, do you think it would be an appropriate thing for the commencement to wait for whatever the nature of a replacement regime, but also with a time limit so that it doesn't become a blank check to ignoring the yeah. passage of the Act? And that's a very specific question. If you don't have an answer, it's perfectly entitled to say you don't have an answer. Yeah. Uh, six and six in the repeal bill that you're In the repeal to. bill, yes, yes, yes. Understood. I think I've already addressed a lot of the substance of what your question is within my previous comments, and I would just refer back to them. It's about perception of the bill and experience of the bill. 
Now, the experience of the bill in terms of protected characteristics is also significantly broader than just one characteristic, yep. and I think that's very important to recognise. And what I said within my verbal submission prior to uh, Colin's very eloquent input was that from a race equality perspective, and the legal definition of race, which is broad, Section 12E creates very specific problems. So, no, while there's a potential injustice via the implementation Boyle, of the my bill, we will don't ask support its continual implementation Mr. Boyle, until my colleagues will ask responds, many, many given other that questions. the hate crime legislation Feel is already other, sufficient. We don't get anywhere. I think, I think we've, you've got We're an answer get, to well, your I'm question. Well, I'm not getting an answer. I've had a lot of latitude on um, supplementaries. I'm moving on now to next question, Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Kavina. Um, this is one for Mr. Halpin. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, do you feel that the introduction of the 2012 Act has led to a change in behaviour uh, in the context of football uh, matches or in, the, in relation to the communities? The, the experience that we have is in the, what referrals we are getting through to us, and the, the, there's no doubt that the year 16, 17 saw us get the most referrals we've, but we've had, and, and we're still in year at the moment. The, um, to say that that's changed societal behaviour, to say that that's changed behaviour in football matches, I think you just need to go to football matches and, and observe it. And, and, and I think we have a long way to go. And, and I, I, think it's much, I think it's true to say that the Act has hugely raised this in the consciousness of everyone who has anything, any connection to football, either involved in it professionally or as a supporter or whatever. But our concern is that Without, and our experience is it can be very successful. Over, well over 70% of the people we work with do report a real change in attitude. And our, our reflection that is we would agree with that. But if you don't work with those people in terms of the belief systems, the boundaries, the, uh, how do they sustain change once they've accepted change, then uh, I, I think, unfortunately, this can be a very shallow issue in Scottish society. Can I also supplement to that? I mean, do you feel that that's made the experience more or less enjoyable uh, for people that you're finding this information from or experiencing? But the, uh, there's, there's, but, well, there, there are hugely positive outcomes. And, 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 and you know, there are, there are broad things about Scottish society that, that almost uh, even today people don't want to confront. Um, we, we, we had one example where one person who went through the programme uh, was happy to, to tell their story, but uh, the, the minute the, their own, the representatives of their own support system realised that they were going to speak up, they were greatly advised to don't do that, don't go public on this, because there's still this uh, stig stigma, the, the very point I'm talking about, that would undoubt it. And I think, I believe there was a real risk that it would, uh, it would affect future employment opportunities for that individual. What was the positive effect? The, 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 the interventions has had a positive effect. There's no doubt Thank about you, that. Thank uh, Liam Kerr, the complimentary. Very briefly, convener, just to drill into that point. Can I ask Ms McFarlane, um, empirically, you, you talked uh, about your personal experience. Have the songs and language that you uh, spoke about reduced since the 2012 Act was introduced? Uh, and if so, is there any evidence that that reduction is a function of the act and not something else, like a change in societal attitude, for example? Um, I, can't, I can't say whether there's been a reduction in the last five years. All we can comment on is, is um, our latest research, and again, what the Equality Network's latest research, and I don't know whether the Equality Network had done research at the start of 2011 or before when the act uh, came in. But um, what we do here and what we see and what LGBT people tell us and what our research tell us um, is that there is a there is a problem around um, LGBT homophobia, biphobia, transphobia at football matches? Be that chanting, be that song lyrics, be that again LGBT people not feeling safe and secure attending football matches or watching um, you know a live football match in a pub, for example. Our research has also shown that um, a percentage of that uh, language or abuse has come within a sport, a live sports setting, whether that be at the actual stadium or at the club or whether that be in a pub, for example. Um, but what we do do and what we have seen in a, a shift from our perspective is the work that we're doing with clubs. So um, we're working on our Rainbow Laces initiative, uh, which basically is actually as they are, Rainbow Laces, um, and that we work with uh, grassroots uh, clubs, but also now working with the SPFL, who supported the Rainbow 
Edinburgh Laces Initiative, and we launched that in November. And we're in conversations with some of the Premier League clubs about how they can take part in that. That's been a shift for us in the last five years, because beforehand, organisations didn't want to work with us on these issues. My, my specific question, I, so has there been a reduction in the behaviour that you talked about as a specific function of the Act being introduced? I'll answer that because we don't have the evidence to suggest that from our research. Thank you. Thank you. Fulton? Yeah, thanks, Hi, and thanks, panel. Um, I, I do want to come back to, um, briefly, I know it's been touched on, um, this issue of a, of a gap in the law. We heard uh, in our last evidence session before recess here from the Crown Pro uh, and Prosecution Service from Anthony McGeekin, a very strong statement from him before this committee that repealing the Act would lead to a gap in the law. And I see that the Scottish Women's Convention have also um, said the same in their submission today. Can I ask each of the panel members what their thoughts on that are? And I, know, I appreciate that some have already touched on it a bit more than others, so um, I will leave it each person's discretion whether they want to give it a brief answer. Mr Halpin? Uh, well, I, I just refer to cases that we have actively worked with, which includes behaviour that you would describe as a, a, a hate crime in occurring in a public house and being referred to as for uh, attitudinal uh, change programmes, uh, very similar to the behaviour that was re referred to as from a football ground under this Act. I'm quite happy to come in very briefly. Bond, we've, we've already outlined quite uh, to, to, at some length um, that we're of the opinion that the hate crime elements which are dealt with within the Offensive Behaviour Act are quite clearly covered by pre-existing um, legislation. The additional point would be that there's quite clearly an anomaly here in terms of the narrative about hate crime and I suppose what's inherent within your question and the fact that the two representative intermediary bodies who work directly with the Scottish Government's Equality Unit on the development of the Race Equality Framework for Scotland and whose members and organisations we work with face the overwhelming majority of hate crime aggravations are both against, are both in favour of repeal of this piece of legislation. That's quite a strange circumstance. Now, the two primary reasons why that is the case, that we remain unconvinced that behaviour that would otherwise not be considered criminal should be criminalised in one particular setting, section 12E. And five years on, we are unconvinced that the Act is necessary and believe that it creates confusion and double standards within hate crime policy and legislation. If this Act was coherent and provided a balanced remedy and took forward the social conversation with regards to hate crime in Scotland, we'd be backing up the Crown Office, the police and the Scottish Government as we do on various other strands of hate crime and equalities work in Scotland. This Act doesn't provide it. Now, the additional aspect of that is organisations such as us, or I think uh, Mr MacArthur touched upon earlier, virtue of criticising this Act or challenging this Act, there's a particular social narrative which is developing that somehow we're pro-hate crime or pro-sectarianism. I've seen that begin to manifest within certain uh, websites or editorials within particular newspapers. Not only is that insulting to organisations who have challenged hate crime their whole lives uh, in conjunction with key stakeholders, including the Scottish Government, it's a really dangerous political binary to set with, it, with regards to legislation which is contested. So for those reasons, you know, we don't see that there will be a gap in the law. I don't think uh, MD around uh, this table would be suggesting that, but I just want to clarify then, in your opinion, that Anthony McGeekin, when he gave us his evidence, is incorrect. I would, I, I'm not going to sit and say that another well, well, person's I, I, submission I, I, I is incorrect. Obviously, from his perspective, it's, 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 it's entirely correct. I, Question, Can I just? Just, I'm quite happy to respond. Though our analysis and, oh, is different to the Crown Office's and different to Mr. McGeehan's, and it's different in relation to this Act in many aspects. Mr. McGeehan, as a humble public servant, has a duty to respond to uh, and protect the legislation which he has at his doorstep, and this is an absolutely critical matter in re with regards to this piece of legislation. Some of the issues which you're dealing with should not be crossing Mr. McGeekin's table and shouldn't be crossing any individual police officer's table. <coughs> These are issues which have to be debated and discussed 
outside of the criminal justice system. Now, in relation to the gap in the law, so and, and I'm just taking on in, in, in terms of I've already covered sections one and two with regards to hate crime and the additional general offensive behaviour. My understanding is from the additional uh, submission put in by Police Scotland following their verbal submission uh, with regards specifically to section six. For example, an individual making a threat intended to stir up racial hatred could not be dealt with using the section six offence, but would risk being prosecuted using other legislation. That's, I mean, that couldn't be clearer to me in terms of that additional aspect which we've not covered so far. Um, there won't be a gap in the law. Yeah. A, a question on travel you were going yes, to get on yes, to because um, that's a pretty long supplementary. I think you're, you're um, going into other lines of questioning other members will be covered. I, I did want to also come to the other two um, yeah. panel members as well on that and as you heard there from the convener if yes, uh, the Ms. answers Ms. could McFarlane, be... Yes, Mr McFarlane, you wanted to come in? Uh, yeah. So uh, our understanding actually is that um, the 2012 Act does cover, um, and I need to get my teeth around it, extraterritoriality, um, which basically uh, means that... Um, matches that take place internationally so Scots going to watch their national football team or the Scotland team internationally if there was an incident of hate crime or abuse whether that's online or at the match that um, uh, they can be prosecuted consistently abroad as well and I think cops had stated uh, the Crown Office sorry, the Crown Office and Prose Prosecutor Fiscal Service had stated before the committee that they had used this piece of legislation to prosecute hate crimes under those circumstances so if you were to take the act away that does that, that does leave a gap um, if you're looking at international matches and um, certainly what uh, the Crown Office and Prosecutor Fiscal Service have been saying as well. No other comments. Okay, Fulton. Yes, um, th this is a question more specifically for um, Sandy, I think, because I, I think um, uh, Colin and, and Danny have talked about the, the groups that they represent um, a wee bit more. Do you think that w has there have been any changes for the, the folk that you represent when going to matches, or um, has the Act led to any changes in that, or you, what sort of things do do you experience when you when you're going to games? You touched on it in your opening statement. Yeah, over, over a, if we're looking over the past five years, as I said, we, we're a young organisation, and I haven't done the same research as the other organisations. But I will gladly involve uh, get involved with this uh, to to find out this. I don't have the data, but in my own experience, I've been doing this for 14 years, and. Um, I have seen instances involving uh, um, aggressive behaviour towards disabled people, and it's part, partly through lack of it's partly because of ignorance. Because not everybody can look at what I. Well, do you know if I've got a disability? You can't tell, and that's that's part of the part of the thing. And it's actually getting, being, getting, getting it to be dealt with by either student or by the police. Or um, we've, we've had circumstances before where we've addressed it, highlighted it, reported it, and get, nothing gets done. So where, where, where do I go from there? Where, how do I get to, 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 to progress that sort of information? Um, I'd like to know from other clubs as well uh, and other organisations, are there other SDSAs, the, the Disabled Sports Associations of what their experience is. And I think I'll take from here um, a, 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 a roadmap, if you want, for a better word, to find out what it is um, and gain, gain experience of this. Um, that's, there still has some. Uh, I, um, I can recall an instance at um, Celtic Park, and where a section of the fans were actually directing the abuse at the disabled supporters because we were at the front, and couldn't get anything done, done about it. So I think some yeah, that needs to be stopped because you can quite clearly see on the CCTV that things were happening. Um, another instance of drunken behaviour, disorderly behaviour. Now that will come, probably come under um, a, a, another part of the law, but I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Um, I, there needs to be something in place. What it is, I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't have enough. 
fair to say that there's still more work to be done by your association yeah, contacting definitely. other clubs yeah. just to uh, arising out of what I've done. heard today yeah, yeah. absolutely no, what you've said is helpful but that's good just to put it in context yeah. I think we really have to to move on now I Phil, this is a supplementary previously asked uh, I think you've just did, done that in the very beginning. You certainly went on message. We need to move on. Okay. Um, Mary? Thank you, um, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, a lot of what I was going to cover has already been um, touched on, but I wanted to start by picking up on something that, um, that, that Colin had mentioned um, in his answer to um, both Liam uh, MacArthur and um, Liam Kerr. When you say that the Act gives um, LGBT people confidence that they will be protected um, at football matches and you know I'm very supportive of anything that can be done to, to make um, any kind of sporting event more more supportive for LGBT people in, um, in general. Um, you also say that very few LGBT people report crime. Now while I understand the Act may give the, the perception that it is safer to attend a sporting event do you have any evidence that LGBT people are actually using the act to report crime? No, I don't have evidence of that. Um, but I'll, I'll take you back to the, the jigsaw mm. analogy that I gave. So yes, we do know there's a problem around LGBT people feeling confident in reporting hate crime to the police. But we also know, as I said, that 82% of LGBT people have heard homophobic, transphobic, biphobic language and abuse um, at football matches. The act, or the principles of the act, form part of that jigsaw that builds that confidence, but there's still work to be done. So there's work to be done in our schools, there's work to be done in our communities, there's work to be done with uh, the criminal justice systems, Police Scotland, there's work to be done with the clubs as well. But this forms part of that armory to make LGBT people feel safer and secure, um, whether that be in the communities, at work, at school, or attending football matches. Um, and uh, so we don't have evidence about whether they're using this uh, uh, in that sense to say that we're going to report or not report around that. But what we do know is the Act does make people feel confident that there is something in place as part of that jigsaw puzzle and part of that armoury that protects them and makes them feel confident and safe. OK, thank you. I'll, I'll come on in a minute to talk about how hate crime can be, um, be, be tackled. But I just wondered if any of the panel, and I, I would appreciate it if we didn't so much rely on um, statistics, but... Do any of the panel members have anecdotal evidence that the kind of behaviour that we are talking about is now less prevalent at football matches because of the Act? Tom. I, I, would, I would certainly say that there is uh, an attitude that goes through those people referred to our uh, um, project that there's more likelihood of robust enforcement towards them. The question is, would that robust enforcement have been possible with the existing legislation. That's, the, that's a key point that I would make, and there's nothing to suggest because of the examples I've given that that couldn't be the case with the, the proper briefing. And my understanding is, is certainly uh, pretty consistently in police briefings through the start of this journey, that even for the officers uh, receiving the briefings, there was confusion for a bit of that, what act do I use because they were so ingrained in their thinking and used to the existing legislation they, they, they were trying to understand why you would use this at the start. So that the commanders and the matches themselves had to explain that and, and take that forward. So I, I, I do think the Act has raised it in everyone's consciousness, and that's why we were supportive of it at the start. And, and in terms of uh, everyone's um, belief that there'll be uh, robust enforcement if it's properly reported and responded to by the match commander. But we're hearing examples in terms of disability where clearly it wasn't appropriately responded to, but it might be circumstantial there at that time, but what's the retrospect of investigation, etc. But, 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 you know, the, the, the final bit is about the message it sends to those who are victimised by this, which is hugely important, but it's also about the message that it sends to those who have those beliefs and cultures and how do we change that, because that is really, really uh, uh, impactful in how we change others who are growing into the sport. And my... My, my strong belief in the experience I've got is that the, the low level of prosecution, the low level of referral, is that we haven't got a grip of that yet. Okay. Danny, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm just <laughs> considering whether I'm going to give a, a personal anecdote or not. I will, because I think it's relevant to the context of your point, mate, that you've asked and, um, and where we're going. 
So at the time in 2011, when um, the, the act, the, the concept around the act was being developed, I was working uh, at that particular time for an organisation based in Glasgow called the Irish Heritage Foundation. The Irish Heritage Foundation were funded via the Irish government's immigrant support programme. Basic premise: they'll, they'll put uh, money into communities where there's a large Irish diaspora. Now, going by how the Act's been um, implemented, I know you don't want me to focus too much on the stats, but it's, it's important as a subsidiary to my main point here. My characteristics, being a lay Catholic person from an Irish diaspora, is probably most likely to be a victim within the context of this piece of legislation. Now, at the time in 2011, I was also one of the people contacted by Strathclyde Police and said, please be careful with uh, what you receive in the post and where you attend on, um, you know, general, uh, in the general public. At the time, the Irish Heritage Foundation submission to the bill's concept was to be against uh, the bill because we didn't see this piece of legislation adding any value for the reasons I've now outlined from a race equality perspective also to a much broader societal issue and putting the focus primarily or disproportionately into football was entirely unhelpful. In terms of how football has developed over the last five years, no, I've not seen from a personal perspective the Act have a, a meaningful um, outcome in terms of some of the behaviours which you've identified here. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything else? No. Um, Colin, you, you talked about the, the, the rainbow laces campaign, and I'm a proud owner of my own pair of rainbow laces. Um, and there's the, um, the, the charter that the Equality um, Network are trying to get clubs to sign. Um, that is, is in, in my view, a very important way of, of tackling um, homophobic abuse, sectarian abuse, all sorts of abuse from the club all, all the way down to, to the supporters. And, and Danny, you spoke about the importance of, of education. Um, how, what other tools can we use within that framework of education to change what are, in some cases, quite deep-seated and quite deep-rooted views on particularly sectarian and LGBT behaviour? You could start calling, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll speak, uh, I can only be speaking it from an LGBT perspective. So uh, you're right, education is absolutely critical. So we know that, um, uh, again, our school report, which we published last month, showed that there are still shockingly high levels of, of homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying in our schools. We know that our teachers still don't feel confident about talking and tackling those issues. Um, the Thai campaign have obviously done a lot of work about raising issues around that. We have a trainer trainer program, which was in direct response to our first school report that came out that showed, I think it was 75% of primary school teachers and 44% of uh, secondary school teachers were told that they can't talk about LGBT issues in the classroom. So we operate a trainer trainer program, which goes in to train teachers specifically on LGBTI issues. They then go back into the school and train their peers. So education is critical. We know, I don't know the stats, but I know Leap Sports, which is an LGBT sports um, uh, uh, campaigning organisation, are doing interventions around sport in school because we know that's where a lot of LGBT young people's really negative experiences of sport and how they feel about sport, again, personally, I can vouch for that, um, comes from. So, so all of that, again, part of the jigsaw puzzle about how we make those changes. But to go back around the Rainbow Laces campaign, there's been a bit of education for football clubs themselves um, around the work that they need to do. Um, I know the Equality Network have been working hard for a long time. We've been doing the same over the last three or four years to even try and get our feet through the door around some of the clubs and the SPFL and the SFA for them to understand that, that, you know, that homophobic, biphobic and transphobic abuse does happen in football matches, that LGBT people do not feel safe about attending. All of that in the mix is making things better and this is when I go back to, the, you know, the act is part of that jigsaw puzzle because um, I, I didn't respond to your, your first question there, but uh, we do believe that the shift that we've seen in clubs and um, the, the governing bodies to wanting to talk about this issue and now actively tackling that issue, we think has come from the higher profile that these issues have had, primarily, well, partly because we think of the act because they tell us that themselves. So I think... 
that's a rumbling answer, I know, but we think you know, education is absolutely key, but it's, again, part of the jigsaw puzzle and part of the armoury that we need to use to tackle this. Do you think that education will tackle the very deep-seated, particularly in sectarian mm -hmm. behaviour? Will education tackle that? Are you, are you asking me yeah. that directly in sectarian <laughs> um, If you're looking at social change programmes, if you look about how... Um, we, you know, you move the dial, that kind of nudging, you would hope so, but I, I, I don't have an honest answer about whether we will completely eradicate either homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, or whether we eradicate uh, sectarianism. But I think through education and teaching our young people about what it's like to grow up and live in a modern 21st century Scotland, we have to be able to talk about those issues and be able to tackle those issues through an education system, yeah. Okay, Danny. Very briefly, two points. Um, education has an incredibly important role to play. Uh, the curriculum for excellence, rights, rep rights respect in schools, offers us t as two examples of conduits for increasing knowledge about 21st century Scotland and the diversity of the communities and populations which live here, and that they're all intrinsically valuable to Scotland as individuals and as communities of protected characteristics. We run a number of campaigns enhanced by our diversity combined by our humanity and so much of that is about celebrating the intangible cultural heritage of the diverse communities who call Scotland home and embedding that within the education process is incredibly important so I'm happy to say that we will be taking forward via the context of the race equality framework work with Education Scotland and other race equality partners uh, to create or review the Curriculum for Excellence resources with regards to that very specific point. Shifting things back to the, the, the specifics of, of football, if we can take one uh, positive, uh, or a number of positives outside of the technical uh, disagreements or discussions we've had with regards to the value or not of the Offensive Behaviour Act, if as a catalyst of this broader discussion, we're able to, to, to put much more emphasis uh, into progressing these issues outside of the criminal justice system, uh, then there's a significant value to be had in that. And if that is hypothetically uh, a coalition of organisations such as us represented here today, fans groups and so on and so forth, to put into uh, a sporting environment what we're what we're in, intending to put into uh, an education environment, then that's something that can be um, highly beneficial. There is a tendency in regards to this bill, in regards to football fans in general, to, to, to talk about them uh, or assess them almost entirely in the negative. Now, I'm going to say something beyond the stats, which I've already said are absolutely minimal, and then actually less. There's less hate crime in football than there is in the general populace. Beyond that, football fans are running food drives from the events that are, or the football games I've attended, I've seen pro-refugee banners, anti-racism banners. I've seen, for probably the first time, pro-LGBT uh, banners uh, a, a, a couple of weeks ago on the appropriate day. So there's a lot of really progressive stuff happening within football clubs and football supporters and fan culture. And that is something that I think has to be appropriately acknowledged. The stats are saying something and the actual development uh, of how people support their teams in Scotland uh, is changing as well and I think we need to harness that as opposed to have these discussions within the criminal justice system because it's polarising opinion and it's creating some uh, fairly significant issues which there's other avenues to tackle. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I, I want to come back to the specific point about education. There's, there's a huge amount of work goes on across education around educating young people around diversity, inclusion and, and, the, and the law. Um, our, our experience and part of our uh, approach is that where a school has specific issues with specific individuals, with behaviours, etc., that is something that needs more than the broad education. That needs actually uh, working with the young people themselves in terms of their beliefs and cultures and all the things that go around that. So I, 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 I do uh, urge real caution about saying, well, we're already doing all that and doing this work. There, there needs to be interventions for this uh, behaviour actually bubbles up through the, 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 the school. Okay. Sandy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, the, the, it was on the, on the element of a bit, it's a bit, a bit about education, but it's, an, a, it's a, a tangent. Um, it's the, a lot of uh, disabled people who go into football matches are scared. Are scared of their environment, scared of what's happening at the ground, whether it be noise, whether it be singing, chanting, or just general foul language. 
and it's, sometimes it's difficult for them to perceive what's going on. And part of some of the stuff I've done around uh, autism and and there's an organisation called Shipley Campaign uh, down in England where we try to help educate and s sort of integrate people into the, the to enjoy football, to go to a game, to enjoy football. Um, and uh, there is a, there's quite a, quite a lot of people out there who will do that. Um, so uh, the, the education uh, that I respect, I think they need to be made to, to be aware that there's stuff in place for them to make sure that they are safe, that people will look after them when they go to football matches. And then it's something will be done if something goes wrong. That's what I what I want to make sure because I've seen a couple of times where it hasn't nothing's been followed through. So it, it, it's to make sure that that element of the society who want to go to football matches who are, don't want they can and they know they're going to be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, we've talked about the um, Lord Brackadale's hate review. And I just wonder if I could ask each of you, you can answer fairly briefly um, if you wish, given that it, um, it's due to report in spring of next year, um, and it will include the 2012 Act, do you think it's sensible to wait until the outcome of that review? Can I just ask each of you in turn? Colin? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sandy? Yes, I need to catch up. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Danny? No, the act should be repealed at the, the quickest possible opportunity because it's not dealing with hate crime and because it's creating significant issues uh, independent of uh, some of the concerns which have been raised today. You, you wouldn't think it's sensible to wait until to you see what the actual review, it might address the points well, you're raising? What we've called for is an educational approach, a universal approach to tackling hate crime in, in terms of taking forward a strategy. Mm -hmm. There's two... The, there's far too many contentious issues inherent with the implementation of the Act. It now long, no longer, as I talked about, about policing by consent, it now long, no longer has the respect uh, or the credibility that a piece of legislation such as this needs. So I would support its repeal as soon as possible, and that doesn't leave any gap in the law in terms of tackling actual hate crime. OK, thank you. And uh, moving on, uh, Rona, could you ask the next question, perhaps? Yeah, um, certainly. Um, just to ask Colin, um, talking about the online abuse that LGBT people, uh, people suffer, I wonder if you could elaborate a wee bit on that. And presumably some of them do report it. And I know you say that there's difficult, there, there are difficulties in people reporting it, but presumably some do. Do you think the repeal of this act would make, make them even less likely? to report it? Um, well, we, we know, for example, that um, LGBT people themselves experience uh, individually um, elements of hate online. Um, I think, let me just see if I can find the stat for you. Yeah, so one in 12 have experienced online homophobic, biphobic and transphobic abuse or behaviour. That increases to one in four trans people, so that's 23%. Um, and even when that communication isn't aimed at you as an individual, seeing that kind of abuse, whether that's on Twitter or on Facebook or, or in forums, um, that increases to nearly half have witnessed uh, some kind of homophobic, biphobic and transphobic abuse or behaviour online that wasn't directed to them, and that's in the last month. Um, so uh, our view is, um, obviously section six, which covers the communications element, is, is, is vitally important. Again, it goes back to sending those, those signals. Um, if the act was to go, would it stop people reporting? I honestly can't say, but when it goes back to the element of if people understand that there is something there that helps them and that is protecting them around online abuse, if, if it goes and disappears and there's nothing there in its place, I mean, the Communications Act 2003 is obviously there, but as far as I'm aware, it's hard. Um, uh, we weren't able to find figures of, uh, available of... Um, whether online hate cases are prosecuted under Communications Act 2003. So I can't make a, a correlation between whether or not that would go. But, mm -hmm. but Section 6, for us, is an important piece of yeah. the, the legislation. Thank you. Okay, can I just ask, sorry, just one, one yes, other bit. Can I just ask Sandy, please? Um, Colin talked earlier about the LGBT community feeling a bit more protected by the Act and, you know, the, the fears if it was repealed. Is that how... 
you think that you know disabled groups look at it as well? Do they feel a bit more protected because the act is there, yes. either at matches or travelling to and from matches? Yes. Well, we've, exp we've experienced, uh, even though we've got a big sign on the bus that says disabled supporters, we still get uh, abused. So, yeah, um, it, it's, it's the, I agree with Colin on this one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Convener. The, my, my questions kind of relate to, to both what Ron has asked and around Section 6 and comments that have been uh, made in regard to that, uh, Section 6 of the, the Act rather than the, the bill that uh, Stuart Stevenson referred to, but also with regard to, to Brackendale. I've, <laughs> it's been clearly made to, to us that from prosecutors and Police Scotland there's strong support for Section 6 of the Act in that it it's been successfully used to prosecute individuals who have been made serious threats of violence against members of the public, including threats of murder and individuals who've made threats towards the Jewish community, the Muslim community, the Catholic community, and uh, designed to stir up hatred on the basis of religious grounds. And <coughs> I have real concerns about the repeal of this act in terms of those who've experienced hateful communication online? And do witnesses feel that the introduction of the 2012 Act has had any impact, not just in, in terms of the practical effect in the criminal justice system, but also sending a message about online behaviour and what online behaviour is unacceptable? And um, if, if I may convene, just um, with specific reference to, to, to Danny Boyle and, and, and Bemis, I think, you know, you, your, your point earlier about how we should uh, always look to, to challenge legislation and, and consider its effectiveness, I'm absolutely with you on that. Um, what I'm, I'm finding hard to, uh, to confer with is the, the, the strong view expressed to, to, to the previous question that repeal should happen as quickly as possible. Surely we have a constructive opportunity here with Brackendale to work together consensually across the, the sectors involved and across the parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary chamber to think about actually how do we pull all of this together, utilising section six and the strong support that there is for that and thinking about other aspects in the bill. And I think it's really important in our communications that we think about this piece of legislation that's under review as uh, uh, having those two elements, the abuse of uh, the, the uh, the, the, the offensive behaviour at football and the threatening communications aspect. Thank you, Kinvia. Um So I'd be interested in thoughts. I may have a supplementary or two after that. Respond to understand just initially section six. Uh, I feel free to be corrected if I'm wrong. Uh, it's been used as 17 charges over the five years. I, I, I'm not able to, quant uh, to, to clarify that figure or not as things stand, but mm. it's a very utilitarian perspective rather than thinking about the categorical imperative and the fact that it has been useful for pro prosecutors in certain circumstances for achieving the ends of justice and that's extremely important. So uh, I think um, the, 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 the focus on whether it's an effective piece of legislation or not should not be judged on the stats. Has been more important or the potential justice which has been uh, attained with use of section six has more value than the, the volatile injustice, which is potentially contained within sections one to five. So, so just let me respond. Of course. We're not averse to reviewing uh, hate crime legislation, which is exactly what we're doing within the context of the Brackadale Review. As I've already acknowledged, the suite of hate crime laws are difficult to navigate uh, and access a remedy for those who are victims uh, of characteristic breaches. In terms of the Offensive Behaviour Act and the sections one to five, as I've already said, I don't know how many times I can re repeat it, they don't primarily deal with hate crime. 18% of crimes um, prosecuted by the, or charges under the Act last year were considered hate crimes. So I can't see the value in terms of us being able to track the trends of hate crime where they're manifesting, what the uh, genesis of that thought or behaviour is via this kind of opaque set of uh, statistics we receive in regards to 
the Offensive Behaviour Act, that becomes even more complicated when we add in the general offensive aspect to it. And I've outlined already that there's particular issues and concerns with regards to that from minority community social, cultural, histori hi historical analysis uh, uh, of events which have taken place in the UK. Um, so I'm not, you know, I think e our, both our points are equally justified. I don't think that, that your point uh, should necessarily supersede uh, the issues which we've already identified with Section 26. And I think my argument maybe holds more weight considering that there is no gap in the law with actual hate crime uh, aggravations. Again, specifically to Section 6, we've already acknowledged from the police's uh, evidence that a racial aggravation wouldn't necessarily be used with the threat and communications aspect of the Offensive Behaviour Act. So we would maintain our position that the Act can be repealed and that if there's any particular uh, positive learning that we can take from the 17 charges with regards to Section 6 uh, of the Offensive Behaviour and Threatening Communications Act, then we can take that into the, the Brackadale Review. But we just can't see the justification for maintaining the implementation of a piece of legislation which has no credibility and doesn't actually, uh, in its entirety, challenge hate crime. Sure, and the, but the, the alternative perspective, of course, would be that by losing section six through repeal there would be a gap in the law and I, I, I appreciate you've disputed that today but others would substantiate that um, 17 charges in section six and i know you 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 take your point in terms of those 17 charges as well I'm, I'm assuming as well, what about what about the 17 people who have been the victims of that crime but you've also got an otherwise offensive you know over 130 odd charges which could easily be argued by the 130 people who have those charges defending on the specifics which we don't have any any knowledge of here that those are unjustified charges well, now, that's that's our particular concern with section 12e so, uh, I, so if we're playing a numbers game who's more important the 17 victims well, that, or the potential 17 well, victims of a miscarriage of justice you, you, you may want to play that numbers game that I, i'm certainly not well, you the, the, the point i'm making is that i think we're, we're getting the, round in circles the, i think well, you've had just, a response is there anything I, I, I just new wanna, you want to bring up well, ben well, I, I just want to state that i think the, the, the question should be perhaps how we look to reform rather than peel that would be a more constructive approach considering the substantial review that lies ahead of us i just wondered if any other I, panel members wanted to come in, particularly on, on the importance of Section 6. The, the, there, are, there are no cases referred into our uh, 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 service in terms of that section, so it, 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 from my perspective, um, it's about how we apply it. I would, I would agree with the application side of it, um, but I think the point you make, um, Ben, about Bracadell being the opportunity to have a, a, an overarching view and review um, is, is absolutely pertinent. So we know that this is coming. We know that it, we can't preempt what's going to come in terms of looking at the, the act in itself as part of the recommendations of Bracadell. But to remove that piece of legislation and have nothing in its place, or not to at least be able to have a considered view of what Bracadell would come back with and how some of the concerns that we've all made about implementation, about whether we think the act's right or wrong, that's the point to have the discussion um, for our point of view. So anything that takes any protections potentially away, and again, the signaling of what the act can mean to people in terms of the symbolism, with nothing in its place or not having reviewed what Bracadell may or may not say, um, for us would be um, a, a folly, it would be the wrong thing to do, a, an immediate repeal to get rid of it quickly before Brackdale has reported back just doesn't make sense from our perspective. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Maurice Corey. Thank you. Yeah, um, Mr Boyle, cutting to the chase, um, if, as you suggest, that the 2012 Act has done little or nothing to tackle hate crime, what needs to be done, in your opinion, to eradicate this um, and also offensive behaviour at football matches? Basic question. Yeah, I may mean, already have uh, touched upon what our suggestion would be. We, again, this is where we share the considerations of uh, our colleagues on the panel and with Mr McPherson that the, the Brackadale Review offers a perfect opportunity to bring clarity to the suite of hate crime legislation which we have at the moment. Independent of that, we feel that there, we need to be careful not to conflate uh, hate crime with the criminal justice system, that we have to have alternative approaches uh, starting at the early stage with uh, education. That's where our focus will be moving forward. And I actually understand from discussions 
with Police Scotland uh, that that will be their additional focus with regards to the Brackadale review. We'll be taking a lot of the momentum or a lot of the burden uh, of hate crime issues out of the criminal justice system and begin preventative educational measures. That should happen across society. Uh, there shouldn't be a disproportionate focus on a sport where the stats are telling us that hate crime is actually happening less than in the rest of society. Right, thank you. Examples of, of some of the initiatives. Um, Fulton, a very brief supplementary. Yeah, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, I wanted to actually ask uh, Tom uh, a question about the uh, the stop um, program. It is disappointing that it's not um, being used perhaps as much as, as would be expected, and um, especially if it's going to give young men particularly uh, an opportunity to divert away from prosecution. And for me, though, and I mentioned this in the last uh, session, that seems more of an implementation issue as opposed to an issue um, to do with the, the legislation as such. So if um, the Act is not repealed and, and it stays, would you welcome um, some sort of guidance perhaps on, on more use of that. And, and I say that actually, we, we are probably should declare an interest in that as a previous criminal justice social worker. I know fine well the good work that SACRO do, and I'm sure it's a very effective programme if given the opportunity. So um, I w wondered what your thoughts on that were. Uh, actually, uh, there's an awful lot of common ground between us. I thank you for your comments. Um, the, 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 there's a harsh reality that Scotland, in terms of this, because of the, the need to send the right message to the, 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 those groups who are victims of the legislation means that those that are making the decision are quite defensive about the decision making. They, 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 they are nervous about diverting people away from prosecution. And it would be one example. Um, and, and, you know, if, 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 you, if you were having a conversation with the, the marking fiscal and saying what circumstances would you mark it away, you'll get different answers. Uh, and while you've got consistent marking policies and all the rest of it, it's, it's, it's how do you make sure that you're respectful to the, to the victims and the groups and the interests that are there. Um, now, in terms of if we repeal this act, will it greatly change the, the, the profile of that service? No, it won't. I I would say a huge bit of the profile of that service is not about the individual interventions, it's about that education, it's about reaching out, it's working in prisons as well and, 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 and going straight to the source of groups who, who are uh, dominantly um, would, would have those uh, behaviours and those embedded beliefs. So I, I do think there is something about the application and, 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 and the process that, that I would acknowledge that. But the, 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 the thing here is, there is a bit about SACRO about um, are we uh, disproportionately targeting one group and criminalising them and stigmatising them, and that impacts on the future opportunity. And, 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 and in this case, uh, I I've, have a view that you legislate when the reason to have that legislation for criminal conduct is, is compelling, it's overwhelming, it's beyond reasonable doubt, and we have a case here where you're having maybe, maybe no, and in that case, I, I'm not convinced. Uh, I'd like to take you back to the Act's aim of tackling sectarianism, uh, and I appreciate the point that uh, Mr Boyle made at the start about the definition of sectarianism. Uh, but that aside, do you think that sectarianism is a significant problem throughout Scottish football? Uh, or, as some may have suggested, is it limited to two particular clubs? And has there been any change both pre and post 2012? Uh, the, the, the referrals into our service are not exclusively from the two clubs that you're indicating. And, 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 and I have like, <laughs> everybody at this panel will have their own anecdotes. And I, I, I bet if you go around the, 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 the opposite side of the table in, in life, if you've grown up in Scotland, you will have been touched by this in some way. So I don't, I don't in any way hold this view it's restricted to two particular football clubs in Scotland. This is a Scottish societal issue. Is that, is that echoed by the rest of the panel? Yeah, we've outlined it. Sorry, do you want to go first? Hi. Um, I'm, a, I'm a man from the North East, and uh, as I grow up th throughout the years, and we hear a secretary, secretary and I thought, what's, I, I didn't know that, what that word was as a child. 
because normally I have a bother about it. It didn't matter whether you were Catholic or Protestant or whether you either had a green scarf or you had a blue scarf or you had a red scarf. It didn't really matter. And that's, <laughs> I wish it was like that today, but it's not. Um, so I think it's also where you are and where you're living as well, whether it's Glasgow, Edinburgh, Inverness, Wick, Stornoway, or Lerwick. It's different everywhere. You don't maybe necessarily experience it in Aberdeen, but you might experience it in Ab uh, Peterhead or Fraserburgh or Forest. But uh, it, whether it crosses uh, religions, it's it, you, know, you can have a. Uh, it, it, it's 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 really is diverse, and I, I, I I've got difficulty in setting it in one straight line. If you want, if, if you understand what I'm trying to say. But do you think then that the 2012 Act? has had any impact, if we, if we start from a position that says uh, there is sectarianism at football, has the 2012 Act impacted upon that? Uh, and if it has, uh, where is the evidence of the, where is the cause and effect? Uh, and if it hasn't, what would be a better way to achieve an impact on sectarianism? This is the perennial question, particularly when it comes to sectarianism. Sectarianism, as we said in our introductory comments, has is, is become like chewing gum. It's what we put on something when you actually, when you disagree with somebody else's particular point or particular opinion. It's becoming a valueless um, concept of trying to describe a set of circumstances or situations. What we see in the Act uh, is that we're able to identify in a traditional sense of what sectarianism is, intra-Christian sectarianism, where there's anti-Catholicism or anti-Protestant issues manifesting in terms of the number of attendees at football and what's coming through in relation to the number of charges and prosecutions under the Act, it's tiny. Now, that doesn't necessarily say that there's not a broader issue around about the whole gambit of uh, social, political, cultural histories which different people have in Scotland and how they interact with each other. But this Act is not providing an appropriate place for those debates and discussions and informed discussions to take place. There's also largely a fallacy that um, sectarianism is the, is, is the prime responsibility of two particular clubs. Again, looking at the Act, 12% of charges, 12% of charges under the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act related to uh, Rangers v Celtic matches one-tenth or just over one-tenth. So that doesn't reflect an issue where, uh, or that narrative that sectarianism in Scotland is primarily the responsibility of two particular clubs. What I'd like to take as to now in relation to sectarianism is, and I've said it time and time again, is the section 1-2-E of the Act, which covers generally offensive behaviour, because what we've seen is the challenge for individual police officers, as again I said earlier, aren't sociologists, anthropologists, historians, who are having to ter interpret uh, songs which are sung at particular football matches or at any football match, which they then are deeming sectarian and focusing it via the generally offensive or otherwise offensive. So it, this is the complication. As we heard from supporters, Direct Scotland, offensive behaviour could be something as innocent as doing the conga at football. Um, where people were then filmed, and that's a procedural issue, which is a big concern. But we know in all seriousness from the Lord Advocate's guidelines and the jurisprudence in relation to the Act that it's most likely to cover songs which shows support of terrorist organisations or glorifies or celebrates events involving the loss of life or serious injury. Now, we must maintain our position that we've articulated throughout this Act's implementation and one that we identified to Police Scotland in, re in relation to the decade of centenaries, which we touched upon within a written submission, that celebrating a British, Scottish or Irish social, cultural or political identity does not in itself constitute sectarianism or offensiveness worthy of criminal proceedings. Now, that is, that's the bone of contention with this particular piece of legislation with regards to Section 12E. And that's the concerns where we have these charges which are going through as generally offensive behaviour. That's, that's where the intersection has taken place, where we potentially would identify, from our perspective, miscarriages of justice going through because of this act, because there's a misinterpretation of what constitutes sectarianism. And instead of me and you having that conversation, or organisations having that conversation, or the communities uh, who, who, who come from those communities having those conversations, it's coming down to the 
an individual interpretation of a single police officer. You there, because I want to just come back in a second, but I know Mr Halpin wants to come in. We're talking specifically, has this act had an impact in relation to football matches and travelling to and from football matches? And I believe there's no doubt it's had an impact. The leadership of this parliament in passing that legislation sent a very strong message to society and to the agencies and to the clubs and to the associations around the clubs that this behaviour was totally unacceptable. And we know that it, it came out of there was events that happened and all the rest of it, and there was a, there was a conversation around that, a public dialogue around that. that so there's, the, the question is, uh, uh, why did it need a piece of legislation to take the leadership and then really, really focus the attention on this as an issue. And, and, and the whole briefings around football uh, became more focused about this behaviour. Briefings within the, uh, the club's own security arrangements, etc. and societal moved on. The question that actually at the Parliament today is, did it have to be the legislation that, 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 that brought that change? That's a, that's, a bigger, that's a bigger discussion, but there's no doubt that having this legislation did shift that, that, that dialogue on at the time. Well, can I press you on that? And because uh, I know Mr McFarlane, was, I think you were nodding there, and you might want to come in on this point. Uh, but just one final question. Sacro submission, uh, and throughout the session today, uh, th there's been some suggestion, or I'm hearing some suggestion, that uh, the criminalisation doesn't address an underlying attitude, such that the question begged is, would it be better to change people's views? Would it be better to change the underlying prejudice, uh, if I may put it that way, such that the behaviour stops and people self-police, rather than using what I might suggest is a, a rather blunt tool uh, of legislation to suppress attitudes and criminalise people, uh, rather than changing what underlies that attitude? But it will be no surprise that it's not a, a yes or no answer. Um, the reality is that you can have a blunt instrument that says you are being criminalised, and as, I, as I've described, if we went to fix penalty tickets, and there you are, there's, the, there's the, my symbol of my distaste of what you've done and go away. Does anyone honestly believe that's going to change beliefs and change attitudes? Now, we're talking here, and, and I have vignettes, I've got uh, case studies uh, of people who have reported to us that this has really changed my thinking. I understand it. I'm now at college, and I'm doing you know, the real life-changing things, because once you start to actually work through people in terms of what their belief systems are, about how do they re recognise the risk of their behaviour, because some of it is they get taken along by the crowd, they get taken along by their peers, and how do they, how do they withstand that? And, and, because that actually can be a very brave position for they themselves to actually be different themselves in that situation and then start the, the, the societal shift that we're talking about, a very small example of it. But the, the, it, it needs the mix. That's the point I'm making. And, the, and the, big, the big thing is, at the moment, the cases that are being prosecuted, if, the, if, if we're looking at 26 in a year and the figures are much higher, what's happened to the others? What's the intervention with them other than the, 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 the prosecution? Can I just go back on a supplementary point there as well? <clears throat> just actually, it made me think of something there, but we, we don't actually have the, the high enough awareness of the narrative of charges which are progressed, prosecuted, and then found not guilty. There's a significant number. I think there was, uh, at the last um, evidence session, there was uh, a differentiation in terms of um, what was the correct figure, but there's quite clearly a significant number uh, of charges and prosecutions under this Act, which take a significant amount of time, which may be precarious in terms of the individual who's arrested and then in relation to who they've actually offended and who the victim is, and then they may be found not guilty. Now, what we've not analysed is the impact that that's had on that person's life uh, throughout the duration of their trial diets uh, and so on and so forth. I would encourage this uh, committee to revisit that um, because it seems to be an absolutely fundamental issue in relation to maybe I'm, maybe I'm hearing things which Colin's not hearing about the implementation of this piece of legislation, which is why we take such a strict line in terms of its repeal having to come as soon as possible. So I think that's something which has, we have to illuminate further and, and look into. Just one final point, and it's, it's 
this is the crux of the matter. We're criminalising people for conduct in one specific set of circumstances, which isn't criminalised in another set of circumstances. That's a fundamental issue. I can go into specifics of um, examples where something's happened at football and something's happened in this parliament, and there's been two different approaches, and they're actually covering, they're actually expressing the exact same thing. To add something, is it a, a lengthy, um, or uh, you want to give more written evidence? You know, after giving. No, it's very quick because it's to deal with okay. uh, parliamentary motions uh, and songs sung at football. So what we were talking about earlier, and it's in our written submission when we um, had met on at the behest, at the request of the Football Coordination Unit focus, because they had concerns about how they were going to police um, events or commemorations which may take place at Scottish football grounds with regards to the decade of centenaries, and their concerns primarily were based upon the 1916 Easter Rising in Ireland, uh, the Battle of the Somme, which obviously has significant connotations for many of the Ulster Scots community who live in Scotland. Now, the advice we gave them was that, as we said in, in our previous point, that celebrating a social, cultural, um, political, Scottish, Irish or British heritage is not offensive or criminal in itself. But we know outside of the parameters of that discussion that people have been arrested for singing songs which pertain to that particular period. So we're arresting people in the context of football under a breach of section 12E. And then at the same time, uh, we have, say, a parliamentary motion put down in the Scottish Parliament, which is celebrating the exact same thing, 1916 and the Irish Rebellion and the, the formation of the modern Irish state. To people uh, on the ground who, who, who are, are dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, that strikes as a class hypocrisy. You know, a social and political privilege for someone within the confines of the Scottish Parliament is not extended to the individual lay person in the street, which is the definition of inequality, which is the, the root of our concerns here. And, and I don't think that that's properly acknowledged or understood uh, within the broader equalities uh, debate around about this legislation. Your point about context is well made. I'm, I'm conscious, Mary, you haven't asked a question. John Finney, you haven't asked a question before I'm asking the member in charge just to uh, confirm, was there anything you wanted to Most of the questions that I had were relating to the Scottish Women's Convention, which obviously oh, they weren't able to here. attend today. And John Finney? Thank you. Okay. Um, did, did you want to come back? Sorry, Mr McFarlane, because I'm just about to bring um, Mr Kelly in. I think your question... Is your question primarily about do we need blunt instruments like legislation to change societal views? Is, is, is that kind of where it's coming from? To an extent. Uh, my, my concern is uh, whether... It's, it's the right way uh, to address... A number of the panel have made the point that there's an underlying attitude here. Uh, and my question is really, is the best way to change that underlying attitude to, to criminalise, uh, or is it better to address the attitude? Because the attitude still exists. Even if you criminalise me for singing a song, I may still hold that attitude. Um. Again, I go back to that analogy about the jigsaw puzzle and being part of the armory. So I think our view very much is, a, is, you know, legislation can change those attitudes and part of that legislative element could then lead to prosecutions. Yes, if you look at drink driving legislation, where it was fine to, you know, down five pints or ten pints and then go taking your car and you weren't arrested for it, then legislation came in and societal views started to change because you would be prosecuted for drink driving. You look at the smoking ban, for example, and the, the health effects that that has brought in. Again, the blunt instrument of smoking in a public place could lead to prosecution. Society and attitudes have changed around that. You look at um, you know, domestic abuse legislation, again, uh, how that changes society. So I think the view is there needs to be a stick at some um, at point that then sometimes moves society forward. If you, if you think it's acceptable to go in your car and having, drink, having drank so many pints to drive and then potentially uh, take life by drink driving and there is no consequence for that, then everybody would still be doing it. If there isn't a consequence, and I'll take it from an LGBT perspective, to be standing in a football match and turning around to somebody and saying you're a faggot, you're a proof, you're a queer and meaning them harm, and there's no consequence for that, um, then yes, I do think legislation is necessary as part of a wider gamut of societal change. And I think it does change, change attitudes. It's a fair point, but does the legislation require to still be in place or is the legislation merely a kickstart 
uh, such that once the process is in motion, you have no further requirement for the legislation. Well, that would be an ideal perspective, wouldn't it? That you would never need legislation in place to stop criminal behaviour or antisocial behaviour or abusive language, but, but we're not there yet, are we? So I think the legislation is absolutely central to changing those attitudes and being there as a, as a deterrent for people uh, to, to act in a specific way, whether that's discriminatory, whether that's to get in a car and drink when you've been drink driving. The legislative element, I think, there is absolutely crucial about changing those attitudes, but there needs to be... Um, a recourse, an enforcement action that it, it sends it sends a signal that around this in particular for us that that behaviour will not be tolerated and it will be acted upon and there will be consequences for people that behave in a certain way. Very briefly and then Mary. Just a, a very brief question. And, and are the panel aware of, prior to this act being introduced in 2012, if someone had committed a sectarian or an, an, an offensive um, or, or behaved in an offensive manner at a football match or on travelling to and from, what legislation was or what, what law was in place to charge and tackle that piece of offensive behaviour prior to the act coming into before Criminal Justice Scotland, that aggravation, the religious aggravation, it still exists, it's still used. Actually, the police still use Section 74, uh, sometimes within the context of football, for a religious aggravation. Okay. Does anyone else want to comment or all agree? Okay, Great. thank okay. you. Mary, did you indicate? Yeah. yeah, it was just a small point um, that Mr McFarlane touched on as well in relation to Liam Kerr's question, because I think I was uh, perhaps disagree with with some of the points that raised by, uh, by Mr Kerr, because I think you raised the domestic abuse legislation, and I see that as one example where we are saying as a parliament that a specific, we are creating a specific offence of domestic abuse, and we're telling people that, I mean, coercive and controlling behaviour is part of that, that we are not going to accept the, the patterns of psychological abuse that we've seen, and that is about sending a message to people that that kind of behaviour is not acceptable. And really, to put it uh, in terms of that, and I understand the point you make, well, maybe if there are some changes, do we still need that legislation? I think, you know, for areas such as that, you're always going to need that legislation in place uh, to help deal with that behaviour. And uh, to me, that is what's important about the Offensive Behaviour in Football Act. I, I completely agree with the points that you made earlier. It's about what message are we sending to people if that act is repealed in terms of the type of behaviour that we'd then be seeing as being allowed and about being permitted again. And so it would really just to be to ask the other members of the panel as well. Um, uh, about that when you look at similar examples, like I've just mentioned, about the domestic abuse legislation, is there not some agreement there that the Parliament does need to send a message that uh, the type of to try and tackle uh, some of the issues that we're seeing here, that we, we do need legislation in place to try and lead that charge, if you see what I mean? I'll give you the final word, I think. Thank you very much. I think the difference is this legislation is a specific group, a specific activity. You know, I totally agree with your point about domestic abuse. Um, I, think, I think we're slightly different here. It would be my own view on it. Um, the, the, the message that we send to, to society is bigger than this one act. You know, this is absolutely unacceptable behaviour. We have to be, there, there's no difference to anyone here in terms of that. And the question is, do you need this particular act to, to carry on to do, to do that message that you're talking about? And I'm not convinced. Okay. Uh, can we bring in James Kelly now? Okay, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I have a point to each of the panellists, uh, if I start off with Mr McFarlane. Um, in the discussion around Section 6, you made the point that there were, there were a high number of instances of your members reporting online abuse. Um, we've heard in evidence, and it's also in the financial memorandum, that there have only been 17 prosecutions in relation to Section 6 over the five years. Do you accept then that the people who, who report instances of online abuse, it's absolutely correct that they expect those to be investigated? Um, and th those who, who make the online abuse to be brought into justice before the criminal justice system. But do you accept if, if you've got members uh, reporting instances of online abuse and there's only been 17 prosecutions that the logical conclusion of that must be that the vast, vast majority of those instances are going through the Telecommunications Act and not through Section 6 in this Act? As I said earlier, we couldn't find any figures that suggested 
um, what those stats were for the Communications Act 2003 about prosecutions and, and complaints have gone through. So I, I, can't, I can't make a comparison about whether that's, that's happening more under Communications Act 2003 or whether you know, it's the same. I, I, I don't know. What I would say around that is, again, it's the signal that the Act sends to, to the LGBT community that um, you know, these communications, online threats, abusive behaviour online will... Um, be tackled um, and if we're looking at it from a football perspective we'll be tackled within a football perspective but I, I can't make a comparison because I, I, don't, I, have, I haven't seen figures from two, the 2003 Act about what prosecutions have happened so I don't know if they're higher, lower We heard from Police Scotland in previous evidence that um, the, 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 the route that was basically being used was the Telecommunications Act and the evidence would, would, would seem to point to that um, what, what message do you think that then gives to, to your members if there's a piece of legislation in place which, and effectively, the, the police and the prosecutors are voting with their feet and deciding it's not good enough to secure prosecutions here and we're having to use a, a different route? Again, it goes back to my whole thing about the gamut and the jigsaw. So, and I would refer back again to what I was saying about Lord Brackadale. I mean, as I said earlier, we know there are implementation problems around this, and as you mentioned, 17 cases, but it could be, again, because I've not seen any figures, I don't know how many figures have come through the Communications Act 2003, so I don't know if they're higher or lower around that. But what I would say is the Brackadale review is an opportunity to look at all of this in the round. So if it does appear, for example, that actually the Communications Act is, is is working perfectly well. There's a higher level of prosecutions under that. That could then be part, form part of what Brackadale comes back with. But again, I'm not going to say one way or the other that one's better or the other because I don't have the figures for Communications Act 2003, so I don't know how many have been prosecuted under that. But I would say is the Brackadale review gives us an opportunity to look at all of this in the round and then to make those decisions from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rear, leaving aside uh, the issues around the Act, um, and just looking at the whole issue of you know, promotion of a good atmosphere around football, uh, we heard in a, a previous panel from the Scottish Football Supporters Association that one of the things they would like to see uh, were the kind of creation of you know, local forums, if you like, where clubs, uh, football supporters and police got together to, to look at the issues and to look at how they could promote uh, good behaviour and good relations around football. Is that something that you and your members would be interested in participating in? That's uh, one of the things we've actually been working with with the Supporters Direct and with the SPFL, S uh, SPFL the, uh, and the SFA uh, over the past four or five years. So we, we built up a dialogue to, to improve this and it's getting it uh, drilled down to the clubs. A lot of the clubs already have something in place with the communities uh, and the uh, fans, the liaison officers have been put in place. The DLOs, the disability liaison officers, they're, they're not in place in every club, but that's something that uh, would help uh, go a long way to the, um, improving the atmosphere and improving relationships between clubs, police, stewarding and the uh, authorities. Okay, I, think that, I think that's something that there would be you know, broad agreement on. Uh, Mr Halpin, you spoke... Uh, in your evidence and also in your submission about your interaction with the Act being in terms of the, the interventions that were referred to your, your STOP programme and you said that there had been three referred through the Act and there had been others that had, that had come through pre-existing legislation. Um, does that then lead you to, is it fair then to conclude from that that the the, the pre-existing legislation that was in place before 2011 uh, w was effective and would still be effective in capturing the type of, of offences that we've been discussing this morning? In terms of the cases that have come to our attention, if it, the pre-existing legislation had been and is in the future applied appropriately with the right message, then you would, you would identify the same people and you would refer them to the same uh, out, uh, interventions for outcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Boyle, in your written submission, you spoke about inconsistencies in terms of legal judgments. One of the 
principles of the Scottish legal system is, is that of legal certainty, you know, of consistency in, in judgments uh, of cases that come before the, the court. Can you give, maybe give just a bit more detail in terms of these inconsistencies and how they have resulted in confusion and what you said was division amongst the judiciary? I think the two from memory that we picked up in our submission was the case of uh, Mr Richmond, um, who had made the derogatory comment about the head of state of the United Kingdom and the leader of the Catholic Church, <clears throat> but was admonished under the Act because this type of legislation wasn't meant for the likes of him, um, despite the fact that it quite clearly said something which uh, could easily be construed as being um, sectarian. And this is one of the small cases in the Act where the word sectarian actually maybe applies, uh, and obviously to, in, in both cases. Uh, and then that's that's not been applied, say, using Section 1, 2E, um, where people have been found guilty on the premise of committing a sectarian crime uh, when the much more e broadly extended interpretation of sectarianism, which has no uh, legal validity within Scots law, is applied. Um, I understand there was an Article 7 Human Rights Act challenge to a specific, in that case, the Donnelly and Walsh case, um, which wasn't uh, successful, but it was with regards to the specifics of the particular song in the case. Um, from our perspective, mm -hmm. that variation uh, in, in just disability is quite a strong argument that the Act, and particularly Section 1, is incompatible with the Human Rights Act. Okay, thank you, convener. That concludes our question. It's been very lengthy, but very helpful um, uh, evidence. And can I thank the witnesses all for attending? We now suspend, and um, our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 31st of October 2017, when we'll take evidence from Sheriff Principal Taylor on the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings. Scotland Bill will also take evidence uh, at stage two of the Domestic Scotland uh, um, D Domestic Scotland Abuse um, sorry Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill and we'll move into private session.